the short remarks from Vice Provost of Internationalization and Equity at Immersion College, Dr. Tony Pinder. He is my co-editor of this volume on reimagining internationalization and in international initiatives at historically black college and university. Uh, it took more than two years of making and collaborating with our contributors from 10 HBCUs. And the good news is this book is coming out next month from Palgrave Macmillan. So now, Brother Tony, over to you for a brief, brief remarks. Greetings, everybody. Thank you, Krishna. Um, first, I just want to just thank Krishna publicly for um, inviting me and approaching me to partner with him um, on this really important volume. Um, I think when the national discussion and national dialogue regarding internationalization and comprehensive internationalization, HBCUs are often overlooked and, um, and, and sort of undervalued in terms of our contribution. And so one of the things I wanted to just highlight just for some context, just tell you how wonderful the world is. Um, so Krishna and I were introduced through mutual contacts at ACE. Um, and he had this amazing idea to put together the first ever volume of essays on internationalization from just rock star contributors um, that contribute chapters to our book. Um, he was quite prolific already on his own in terms of writing and publishing in this area. Um, and I think the idea was because I had worked in two decades at four institutions as a senior international officer, uh, two of those institutions were Morehouse College, my alma mater, and Dill Dillard University, um, as well as Georgia Gwinnett College, and now at Emerson College. Um, also, um, my dissertation actually was on this very subject um, almost 13, 14 years ago. Um, so I think someone thought that we were a perfect marriage in terms of um, both lived experiences in this work, he at Morgan and me at other places, um, and to come together. Um, one of the things I just wanted to close out with is just, you know, it's, it's interesting, anything in any, any time that you look at where we are or where we're headed on any subject, it's important to understand where we, where we come from. And so it was very, very important for us to treat in a historical context, the experience that HBCUs have had um, with internationalization. They have always been international. They have always been global. And from the very um, sort of constructions of their visions and, mission, and missions back in the 1800s, um, there was always an unmistakable global vision aggressively um, coming out of the charter missions of these HBCUs. And just to highlight it, just in terms of international student matriculation, that began for H HBCUs in the early 18, 1800s um, with the likes of some 23 South African graduates um, coming, coming out of Lincoln University between 1896 and 1923. The great feminist, South African feminist, Charlotte Maye was first um, female to graduate, African female to graduate from the American institution um, from Wilberforce in 1901. Um, during the 1930s, three African graduates of HBCUs would go on to be the first presidents of their nations, Malawi, Nigeria, and Ghana. And then in terms of the, just the dual, we hear a lot about the dual responsibilities of education of HBCUs, right? That Du Bois um, great duality description um, with a very social, ethical, responsible mission produced people like Anna Julia Cooper, who became one of the first um, black females to get a PhD from the Sorbonne and only the fourth um, African-American woman to get a PhD in, in the nation's history. Um, and she would go on um, to become um, the, a major quote um, in the middle passages of your passport, as well as Oliver Golden, who took the first delegation of agronomists and agriculturalists over to Russia um, to look at cotton production and, and other um, agricultural um, pursuits there as well. So we've always been this way. We have always had this focus on internationalization. And I think it was just really important for us in the, in the volume to treat that so that we knew where we come from, we know where we're going. We've always been a leadership production um, in terms of what we've done with leaders in a production with global competence. So I wanna kind of end there because the content and some of the other wonderful discussions that are gonna ensue um, really help shape and really show how far we've come in this regard. So Chris, I'll give my time back. And thank you all. I would just like to say that I've, I've really enjoyed the, the conversations in the chat almost as much as the, the, the verbal comments and reflections of the, of the speakers today, because I think one thing it does um, is, is really highlight that internationalization is not a monolithic process, right? And the one thing that we know about internationalization is that it really depends on your approach, the, institu the really unique institutional profiles and histories of those institutions, 
and, and how you translate that into your own internationalization on your own campus. And I'm speaking specifically um, for our HBCU colleagues that are here. Um, having worked at two HBCUs and, and, and now a PWI, I know there is always that resource issue. Um, and so from, and, and, and let's say that's the elephant in the room. No one here does not understand why internationalization is important in any of the various strategies that we've been talking about, whether it's international student re recruitment, inbound students or outbound um, study abroad or, or, or whatever. So we, we all get it, right? The thing that we don't all got is the resources to invest in what we all know to be true. Right, and, and I found that coming to Emerson, which is a reasonably resource institution, and in seven years, we went from having one faculty-led study abroad program to 30 faculty-led study, study abroad programs. We went from increasing 300 student international student enrollment to now almost 850 international students. And we've moved almost 60 faculty members through a studio, a faculty development studio, where we work with them on internationalization of the curriculum and also providing them with other inclusive pedagogical practices um, for curriculum, right? But this has all been done with a bit of intentionality. Um, not every institution has internationalization as a, strate a strate strategic priority of the institution. That also is leverage and currency and momentum. Um, and so we, you know, this, this conversation about the importance of it we all know the importance of it. And just the chats is just so powerful. Just what I'm reading in these chats, the various strategies and things that you all are doing. Um, and it's challenging to do that um, when internationalization is not an articulated priority of the institution. It's a lot easier to do it when, it when it's embedded into other strategic priorities. So I just want to applaud and take this moment to applaud all of the colleagues that are here, whether you're at an HBC or not, but also I know how difficult and how challenging it can be. Um, my first foray into international higher education was 20 years ago at Dillard as associate dean of global studies. And I was an office of one. I used to ask myself, what am I dean of? I'm dean of myself, you know, and running around trying to negotiate and partner with other stakeholders on the, on, on the campus who were really amen corner to it. Um, and then we had to figure out how to raise money, how to move money around, how to be nimble, you know, how to define it, it being internationalization for ourselves. Um, and we continue to do that. And I know a lot of you are doing that where you are. So I'm just taking this moment to applaud you for what you do um, and, and, and looking forward to hearing more about it. You know, this book is, is supposedly the inaugural book, but we, we all need to write more and we need to engage more and tell our story as HBCU. So thank you so much.